That boom you felt? Just us saying good morning. That's the sound of a 155 millimeter shell going off, the original crowd disperser. On the front, they call them kabanchiki, which can be translated as little boars or piglets. We hit ammo depots and fuel storage points. As for enemy personnel, it's impossible to count how many were eliminated. Inside a 155 millimeter shell lies modern PBX, plastic bonded explosives, which are 1.3 to 1.6 times more powerful than regular TNT. It's like getting a little extra sauce in your military mess hall. Oh no, stop it, dude. Never trust a private who says, I saw it on YouTube, especially around explosives. But you can trust a sergeant. Still, neither the presence nor absence of powerful explosives or shrapnel affects shot accuracy. If you want to lob a shell straight into your millionaire grandma's picnic basket, you need a solid long barrel. And trust me, this video's got plenty of those. But even the longest barrel won't help if you just shout, hey boys, I see the enemy. Let's launch the piglet and make them regret it. Nobody, here's how it really works. You don't actually see the enemy. You just know the general direction of their positions. So, the first thing you need is a good firing position for your gun. If your battery is supporting an advance or covering a retreat, it's like scouting out a picnic spot. Except instead of sandwiches, you're setting up piglets with fillings. That's when you call in the guy with the bustle. I'm a topographic surveyor. My job is to calibrate the gun for accurate fire. I set up the bustle and the night targeting point so the gun fires more precisely. A bustle is basically a high-end artillery compass. It measures the angle between the gun and the target. Even a one-degree mistake can send your shell hundreds of meters or yards off target, especially if you're firing from 10 kilometers out. Now imagine where your little boar ends up if the distance is 20 kilometers, 30 kilometers, or even further. Let's just say the commander won't be handing out compliments. Then the gun is quickly placed in the firing position. The gunner uses the sight to aim based on the bustle's data and waits for the target coordinates. You can't fire without an order. During active maneuvers, a friendly fire incident is every artilleryman's worst nightmare. During an operation, an artillery rep is always present at the command post alongside other units. This makes coordination much easier. We all understand where our guys are moving, and where the artillery is about to hit. Even on a stable front, artillery doesn't fire from random pretty spots. First, the position has to be hidden from drones and satellites, ideally under a forest canopy, between buildings or behind terrain folds. And if it's a long-term position, dig, dig, and dig. Whoever says artillerymen don't dig has no clue what they're talking about. You have to dig everywhere. The guys build shelters, camouflage the guns, because the enemy doesn't sit still. Their recon works really well. So how well you hide your guns directly affects whether your crew lives or dies. But there's a catch. Your position has to be on solid ground. If you dig into a swamp, not even a giant truck will pull your howitzer out. Sure, it's harder to dig, but remember, if a vehicle can't reach your position, you're going to end up hauling those shells by hand. And when it's time to pull out, not even St. Barbara, the patron saint of artillerymen, will save your gun from the mud. Phew, all dug in. Now we can grab a smoke and some coffee. Ever imagined it could be this cozy underground? Chill. Chill. Target? Yeah. Hey guys, wait, how do you know where to shoot? Guys, guys, they can't hear me. Okay, I won't interrupt. Let me ask someone else. Back in the day, you'd get target coordinates from some dude sitting in a tree, or even hiding inside a tree trunk. They'd adjust fire by shouting, short, over, direct hit. And yeah, those kinds of specialists still exist in this war. We work as part of a reconnaissance and fire complex. Our gear is an artillery compass and a drone, but now they're a rare breed. Hey, get down from that tree. These days, it's recon drones doing most of the spotting. All the coordinates we use come from the fire control center. They see everything through drones. They're our eyes. Without them, we don't shoot. We just don't know where to aim. Here's how it works. Find targets, we send out a drone system, short or long range. Once the drone spots a target, it locks onto the location and helps the artillery hit more accurately. We observe where our shells land and adjust for better precision. Once they get the target's coordinates, the gun commander calculates the distance, either old school, using a map, or with a tablet. Then comes the command. Shell, high explosive fragmentation. Charge number three, elevation angle, 340. Azimuth, 2750, fire. 
yeah, it sounds like gibberish, but for an artilleryman, it's like a McDonald's worker taking an order. So here's the breakdown. High explosive fragmentation is the most versatile shell. It combines blast damage with shrapnel, making it effective against dugouts, vehicles, enemy personnel, you name it. Charge number three. That's the powder charge, packed into a little white bag. It determines the initial speed of the shell. Charge number one is the weakest. Number seven is the most powerful. Number three, think of it as medium roast. Not too close, not too far. Elevation angle 340 means the barrel of the gun needs to be lifted about 20 degrees. Azimuth 2750 refers to the horizontal firing direction. 2750 corresponds to 165 degrees. In artillery speak, that's south-southeast. Fire. Well, that one you already know. You could shout it right now, and no one would question you. Complicated? It's just a matter of memorization. That's why not everyone gets into artillery. There's no set formula to know if someone will be a good artilleryman, but it definitely helps if they've dealt with math in civilian life. Now, let's talk about Kabanchiki, or the piglets. Quick brief. A DPICM round, or the piglet, as the guys call it, is packed with nasty surprises inside, shrapnel and mini bombs. When it hits, there's no worse place to be on Earth. We use cluster shells against infantry or light vehicles. For heavier vehicles, we go with high explosive fragmentation. And for dugouts, just straight up HE shells. When it comes to wiping out infantry spread out in tree lines or brush, there's nothing better than DPICM. That's why in the Russo-Ukrainian war, both sides use them. And that's lesson number one in modern artillery warfare. Their kill radius? It depends on the type of 155mm shell. Some have shrapnel that spreads up to 400 meters. Others, just 200. Not bad at all, right? But what about heavy armor? For that, there's a different beast. This is the SMART 155 round. We use it against tanks. A SMART stands for Suchtsunder Munition für die Artillery. A lovely little German death machine. Inside are two submunitions that pop out at around 1,000 meters altitude and parachute down gently like Chip and Dale. Then boom, not even 100 millimeters of armor can save the crew. Yep, a classic piece of German engineering. The Germans always knew a little more about war than most. Enjoying this video? Smash that like button. It helps more people discover the truth. But right now, there are two most experienced armies on Earth, Ukraine and Russia, going head to head for the fourth year. That's why this channel breaks down this war. Thanks for subscribing. You have subscribed, right? Right? Okay, time to be amazed. Inside those parachuting Chip and Dales, beyond the explosives and electronic brains, you've got infrared, radar, and radiometric sensors. They'll find a tank even if it just farted us and puffed out smoke. But you can't just launch a smart shell and hope the chipmunks sort it all out on their own. That's where Ukraine's crop of a combat control system comes in. Think Google Maps, but for battlefield chaos. On a tablet or phone, it shows enemy positions, friendly forces, incoming fire, observer locations, all in real time. Everyone's synced, and anyone spotting a target can drop a pin. Say a recon guy spots a tank. Boom, he taps the crop of a map. Artillery crews, mortar teams, drone operators, everyone sees it. And a minute later, a piglet's on its way. The real magic of Kropova is that range and trajectory are auto-calculated. It has a ballistic calculator for every type of gun in the Ukrainian army. Now even a cook can become a gunner? But hold up. Every new recruit is taught how to do every role in the gun crew. You might start off loading shells, but you could end up commanding the gun, even leading a platoon. So yeah, one way or another, you're gonna get ripped. First you're stacking shells, then you're lugging 45 kilogram rounds around. That ain't the same as flexing at the beach on vacation. If you load a hundred shells a day, your back turns to stone. You come back feeling like your whole body's locked up. My loaders have arms like orangutans. They move 10 to 15 tons of ammo per day. Of course, if you're Archimedes' grandson, maybe your biceps will be a little smaller. Still, even with satellites, tablets, Kropiva, drones, and laser beams powered by antimatter, artillery crews need to know the old-school ways. That means calculating by hand, using a compass, and reading a proper military aiming circle. Why? Because war isn't a video game with a permanent Wi-Fi connection. The battery can die. It might rain, and your electronics short out. Your comms or GPS might get jammed. Or something explodes so hard nothing works at all. 
Then all you've got left is a map, a pencil, and your head. Also, you're not working with just one system. Since the war started, Ukraine's artillery force has become the most varied in history. For example, we have all calibers from the Italian Malara 105mm to NATO standard 155mm howitzers. Every battery commander has to know how to operate them all. Time to talk guns. Ukraine's got the best barrels from all over the world. Made across a full century of design, at the start of the war, most guns were Soviet-made. And they're still kicking. What's their main advantage? Soviet weapons aren't too picky about maintenance. Western ones? Yeah, they're a bit more high maintenance. That's just the reality. Some of the towed howitzers sent over by Ukraine's allies are as old as the Soviet ones, but no less deadly. Take the L-119, a small but angry British 105mm gun. Our gun fired 206 shells in a single day. That was during the Wagner breakthrough. We covered our battalion and held them back. What makes it deadly is the barrel. That's where the accuracy comes from. And it's the biggest strength of this howitzer. Most Soviet guns lose accuracy when used like that, end up shooting at birds instead of tanks. This thing weighs 1,900 kilograms. The D-30? Almost a ton heavier. You can literally move the L-119 by hand. Two people are enough to spin it around. Honestly, I'd take this baby out with my buddies for some weekend target practice. You can tow it with a regular Jeep. But if you've got a Honda Civic, or you're shopping for a gift for your wife, check out this little beast. Doesn't eat much, but sure knows how to bark loud. Fire! <laughs> We fire about 100 to 150 shells per gun per day. The OTO Malera Mod 56, also known as the Pack Howitzer, can be disassembled into parts and carried on your back, by mule, or even flown in by aircraft. We operate at various distances. It might be one kilometer, maybe two. We can also fire at the maximum allowed range, between two to five kilometers, depending on the sector. Of course, these 105mm howitzers won't win the war by themselves, but they can hurt the enemy on small sections of the front. Their max range is about 10 kilometers, which means they're working right up at the front line. But thanks to their compact size, they're much easier to hide and move around. Now, to hide an M777, Ukrainians have to build decoys, because Russian Lancet drones actively hunt them down in forest strips. Decoys are now an entire subgenre of the war. Our channel even has a video showing how they're made and used. Check it out to see what real deception looks like. Fire! The barrel life of the triple axes, as Ukrainian troops call them, is about 2,500 rounds before the tube needs replacing. These howitzers fire like basketballs landing in the hoop. They have a margin of error of up to 3 meters. 3 meters for a 155 millimeter shell? You're not walking away from that. Seriously, you won't find a single person on YouTube who survived a direct hit. But the real game changer for artillery, drones. Really Lancet. Our howitzers have been hit by lancets. Here's a lancet fragment. These things are made of sticks and glue, but there are just too many of them. These flying pests make it impossible to stay in one place. But trying to move a towed howitzer fast? Not easy. That's why the true MVP of this war has been the SPH, self-propelled howitzer. Sure, everyone knew SPHs were effective, but no one expected just how well they'd fit modern warfare. Troops even have a phrase for it now, shoot and scoot. See, with a regular howitzer, you need a truck to haul it, time to stop, set up, aim, that all adds up. But an SPH, it drives itself to where it needs to be. It takes just 30 seconds to deploy fire and then another 30 seconds to pack up and move out again. If artillery is the god of war, then the archer on its Volvo truck chassis is Zeus, the king of gods. This beast is basically a cannon and a truck rolled into one. It drives itself in, fires fast, and gets out. Think of it like that guy who shows up at a party, slaps everyone around, and disappears into the night with the prettiest girl. Yeah, it's one of the best self-propelled artillery systems. The crew only reloads. The machine does everything else. They don't even step out of the cab to fire. These guys are living large compared to other artillery crews. The targeting data is input while the vehicle is moving. As it approaches a firing position, the gunner simply punches coordinates into the onboard computer. That's it. No aiming scopes, no azimuths, no angles. The barrel lifts itself, and boom, three rounds in 15 seconds. The shells haven't even landed before Archer is already gone. But Archer isn't the only wheeled SPH in Ukraine's army. 
A wheeled chassis means fast legs and a long reach. On the highway, we can hit speeds of up to 80 kilometers per hour. Enter Bodana, Ukraine's homegrown wheeled SPH. Its gun is chambered for NATO's 155 mm standard, so it can fire international rounds. Bodana played a key role in cutting off Russian logistics by hammering the Antonivsky Bridge near Kherson in summer 2022. We fire based on signals from a drone. The drone spots the target, sends me the coordinates, I pass them to the battery, and after firing, the UAV adjusts our aim. See, the tools have changed, but the recon artillery teamwork remains the same. Bodana even had a rather unorthodox debut. The Ukrainians loaded her onto a barge sailing down the Danube to get close enough to hit Snake Island. It was weird floating down the Danube on it, but firing from it, totally normal. Still, wheeled SPHs aren't a silver bullet. Their off-road capabilities are limited. We had a brake line tear. The vehicle stopped and wouldn't move. Winter is coming. It'll be mud and frost. This will happen nearly every day. That's when it's time to talk about tracked SPHs. These are also present on the battlefield. And thanks to modern electronics, targeting works basically the same, no matter what they're mounted on. The machine has a gyro compass. Once it reaches the position, it already knows where it is. It just needs to send those coordinates to fire control. With the battlefield swarming with drones, Ukrainian M109 crews constantly rotate positions or go into full stealth mode. Can you dig in an M109? Absolutely. It also features an automated fire control system. Here's how it works. This is the gunner's computer, and this one's mine. I input the GPS coordinates from my navigator. No matter where I've stopped, I send those to the commander. He gives me the target coordinates, and I can fire immediately. No aiming scopes needed. So, yeah, you just crawl out of your hide, do your job, and disappear. Recognize this beauty? I input coordinates, choose the fuse type, set the detonation method. If it's programmable, I enter the burst height, apply corrections, press save, and I'm ready to fire. That's the PZH-2000 also on a tracked chassis, and one of the most powerful guns on Earth. You could call it the Mercedes of artillery, although it's not as fast as wheeled SPHs. Its autoloader in the newer versions is ASMR material. I fall asleep to the sound of that mechanical guillotine every night. Maybe it's because I'm part German. Or maybe it's just that tracked SPHs inspire more trust. Who knows? But tell us in the comments, which SPH do you think will dominate the battlefield in the next 10 years? Wheeled or tracked? Or maybe we'll see a surprise comeback of towed artillery. If you like this new format, drop your topic ideas below. Most liked one gets the spotlight.